I invite us now to attend to the reading and hearing of our Scripture lesson this morning, taken from Paul's letter to the Romans. I'm reading from the sixth chapter, verses 12 through 28. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves to sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you have, have to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, Your servants wait upon You, and we pray that the words we speak, the meditations of our hearts, might be acceptable in Your sight, for You are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today we begin a mini-series of sermons that are drawn from Paul's letter to the Romans. This passage from uh, chapter 6, next week a passage from chapter 7, the following week a passage from chapter 8, and actually then Savannah will preach one Sunday and then we'll conclude actually four weeks to this series uh, on the 30th of July a passage from Romans chapter 8 also. So I'm drawing upon these texts to give us a context for these sermons. And I say, I'll start off with that term context because that's important. Some of what is in the sermon today you've heard before in other sermons that I've preached since I've been here. Uh, but context is important because this context is a little bit different than the last time you heard some of what's in today's sermon. Context is very important. Let me give you a great example. Here, as we are close to the celebration of our nation's founding and the freedom, the freedoms and freedom that we enjoy and many have sacrificed for and continue to sacrifice to maintain, when Paul speaks of slavery and freedom in this passage in Romans chapter 6, the context of the hearers is very important, as well as the context of the author and the setting in which it was originally written. But the context of the hearers is very important. Someone who hears those terms that Paul uses about slavery and freedom, who is of African-American heritage, 
persons of color whose ancestors were enslaved, even brutalized, even oppressed, even discriminated against for 400 years in America, will hear these passages very different, very differently than someone who has skin color like mine and a background like mine and a heritage and a family name like mine. And so we have to hear the Word of God in the context in which we receive it. That's always important in understanding the Scriptures and wrestling with them and engaging them in a deep and serious way. Context is important. So today I want us to consider the freedom that we have in Christ and the slavery that we experience to the righteousness of God in the context of adoption. Adoption, that's another term that Paul uses, and we'll come back to that again and again. I recall an incident from my childhood that has probably been repeated hundreds and hundreds of times. Maybe you recall something similar as you were growing up. I heard and understood for the first time what the term adopted meant. It was in the cruel context that kids sometimes fall into of teasing and berating each other. A group of little kids had surrounded a little girl in the playground on re during recess at school, and they were taunting her and teasing her about being adopted. You don't live with your real parents. Your real parents didn't want you. You're adopted. And that last word was said with such a scorn that it was as if it was the worst thing that could happen to anybody. Prior to this particular occasion, however, somebody had done something really wonderful for that little girl. Somebody had helped her know how much she was loved and valued. And that little girl stood right up to her tormentors and looked them in the eye and held herself up straight and said, you're right, I'm adopted. That means my parents picked me out special. They chose me. They picked me out among all the others. They wanted me. And that crowd shut up right quick and quit bothering her. No one could argue with her logic or her conviction. If we could carry with us through life one conviction from our faith, from our baptism, it would be that. That one thing would be enough, that God chose us. God wants us. God considers us special, valued, precious. God goes to great lengths for us. You know, every time we gather around a little baby in the context of worship and for baptism, and we're going to do this next week, Every time we gather around that little child and we hear the pastor say the words of baptism and we share in the liturgy and we say the words again and we watch the water drip from the pastor's hand over the head of the little child and the parents are there smiling and happy and glad and maybe some others are around, each one of us, each one of us at one time or another, just like that little baby in one way or another, was prodded and called and claimed and saved by God before we even knew it. John Wesley used that big word, prevenient grace, to describe that. Before we even knew it, God has been at work in us. You know, we live in a culture, in a society that glorifies the individual and, and, and individual freedom. And, and those things have their place for sure. 
We so, show so much respect generally for the self-made woman or the self-made man who has it all together, who is in control. But the Christian faith, probably best represented through our baptism, reveals that notion to be a lie. We are no more in control of our lives and our destiny than a little baby. As Paul says, we cannot do the good we want to do, and we can't stop ourselves from the sin, the very sin that we hate. While we were yet sinners, God saved us. And God tells us that we are not in control, that it is God who gives us life, and God who gives us faith. Paul actually uses this, this analogy of being slaves. We will be obedient slaves or servants, he says, to that which serves as our master. And Paul says that in being set free from, the, from sin by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, we then become slaves of what? Righteousness. And therefore, instruments of righteousness. You see, none of us actually join the church. We, we, we say that. We use that language. We become members, we say. Actually, we were adopted. We were brought in and claimed. Some of us came in kicking and screaming. But we were claimed. We were, we were brought in. Did any of us choose our parents or our family members? We do not join the body of Christ as much as we are joined into it, kind of glommed on, if you will, Again, sometimes before we even really fully realize what it's all about, or even before we knew that we wanted to. From the earliest days, Christians have spoken of their faith and their baptism in terms of adoption. God's wonderful grace, which comes to us undeserved and usually unexpected, but most certainly without our full understanding, and that's okay. That's the way it's meant to be. The story is told of Sam Houston, one of the founders of Texas, who later in his life, when he was over 60 years of age, got religion and decided he wanted to be baptized, and so he was, in the local river. And he wrote to a friend, they told me that by joining, God would wash away all my sins. If that be the case, I pity the poor souls living downstream. We've all been brought into this thing without fully realizing the magnitude, the fullness of God's grace, but touched enough by it to know that it gives us life, to know that it is what matters. What wondrous love that makes of us new creations. Can we ever hear enough of the moving passage from 1 Peter which speaks of this wondrous grace, the writer acknowledges the unbelief of the world and then says, but you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people that you might proclaim the mighty acts of Him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy." One contemporary Christian writer offers another analogy which helps us understand this gift of faith and belonging and baptism. She writes that faith is like the darkness of a room which is suddenly lighted. The darkness does nothing except to receive the light. It contributes nothing. It simply receives. But when the light shines, the room changes dramatically. It is full of light. Without the light, the darkness is simply darkness. With the light, the darkness is transformed. Every time the church baptizes a little baby, we're saying that this baby at six months looks just like you and me at six or 16 or 66, so far as our relationship with God is concerned. 
we never cease being dependent upon God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We never get so old, so mature, so strong, so self-sufficient, so adept at love that we will not be dependent upon God to love us, adopt us, choose us, and bring us home. Consider what happens when parents adopt a baby. The baby does not realize he or she is being adopted. It only knows that its needs are being met, it's surrounded by love, it's being given love, and perhaps it notices some new sights and smells and sounds, voices maybe. A baby has no choice in the matter. But when the adoption is complete, that child becomes their child. The baby's status has changed. The baby is now a member of a new family. Faith, then, is simply the accepting of our new status. Unbelief is the rejection of our true status. But our unbelief can't undo the fact that we are God's children. We may deny, we may chase after other gods, we may pretend and go merrily on our way as if that had never happened, as if God doesn't happen. We may try to become slaves of the wrong master. We may run just as hard as we can away from God. But like the prodigal son in Jesus' parable, we have a loving father who is waiting and yearning, and hoping, and forgiving, and loving, and calling us to love as God loves. You know, I mentioned to our children just a few moments ago about the voice that rang out at Jesus' baptism. Here's something also to remember about that. That baptism, Jesus' baptism, takes place at the beginning of His public ministry, before the crowds have gathered, before the teaching and the preaching, before the healing miracles, before the casting out of demons, before the gathering of the disciples, before His confrontation with the Jewish elders and other powerful people, before His fateful journey to Jerusalem and His time of trial and suffering and death, there came a thundering whisper that said, this is my child, I love him, he is mine. Jesus does nothing to earn this favor. Jesus does nothing that God might reward him. God loves because God is love. And that love alone is what makes us lovable. Before all that public ministry and the fulfillment of His purpose, Jesus was touched and claimed and cleansed and washed by the grace of God in those muddy waters of the River Jordan. Can we who hear those words spoken to Jesus trust that they are meant for our ears our hearts, our lives also? Can we trust that the grace of God moves no less powerfully in our lives, yours and mine? It's at work if we will watch for it, wait for it, listen to it, and follow it. And finally, share it. But the wondrous possibility of God's grace, cleanse your soul, claim your will, and refresh your hearts to serve the Lord. Amen and amen.